the next presentation will be from our winner in engineering, Dr. Jeffrey Reimer, who is the Abraham E. Duckler Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Houston. Dr. Reimer is an internationally recognized expert in crystal engineering, uh, whose, uh, uh, whose research is, is unique in in situ surface science techniques led to this, his seminal breakthrough in non-classical uh, crystallization. It has widespread application for such things as producing drugs for treating diseases such as kidney stones and malaria, and for developing catalysts in the petrochemical industry. And as an oil and gas guy, I can't wait until he figures out how we can sprinkle some of this on an oil spill in the open ocean and, and, and take care of oil spills that way. Uh, so Dr. Raymer, uh, please come up. And we'll have five minutes for questions and answer after the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Okay, advancing. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, <laughs> thank. You. Well, first, thanks to Tamist as well as the O'Donnell Foundation for this honor and the opportunity to be here to talk about the work that we're doing at the University of Houston which focuses on crystallization, which I think everyone to some degree in this room understands because crystals are around us in daily life. Whether it's crystals that form naturally, those that are in consumer products, those that we make synthetically in the lab as well as in nature, and those that, that can be uh, implemented in a lot of industrial applications. And so although over the past two centuries we've learned a lot, there's still quite a bit in this area that we don't understand, particularly in the area of crystal engineering which is the focus of our work, where we really look at two different types of approaches to this. On the left-hand side, crystals that have neg negative implications, for example, in diseases like um, pathogenical formation of kidney stones or in malaria, where the goal here is to suppress crystal growth. Now, on the right-hand side, we want to control crystal growth in many materials. For example, zeolites that are used as catalysts in the petrochemical industry, where the goal here is to tailor properties. Now, when you look at this from an application standpoint, you can't get any dissimilar than what's shown here on this slide. And so one of the underlying links between this is at a fundamental level, we really look at what are the mechanisms by which crystals grow and how can we control these processes on a molecular level. And so the ones that I'm highlighting in red are the ones that I'd like to talk about today, beginning with those in biomedical applications, where we see that these crystals grow classically, where ions or molecules will come to the surface, they will form layers, and then they propagate two-dimensionally on the surface of the crystal. And one of the ways that we can control this is through additives that we term modifiers. And as shown in the schematic at the bottom, they will target specific surfaces of the crystal. Not only do they change the shape, but they slow down the process. And what's interesting is that these modifiers can take various forms, as simple as ions like sodium, or as complex as macromolecules like proteins. And this is particularly true in biological systems such as kidney stones where they can regulate the formation. And what I'm showing you here are a wide range of constituents, both inorganic and organic, that can form. I'm gonna focus on calcium oxalate, which is the most predominant case. The pathogenesis is quite complex in these, but they can really be boiled down to these four processes here, where crystals form, you can see aggregation, you can also see then, of course, retention, which is problematic. Now, two facts that are quite diatomically opposed and interesting is that one, Kidney stone rates are on the rise and are continued or predicted to be so in the future. But at the same time, in the last 30 years, we have not seen new therapies that have been designed. And so this is the focus of our group, where we try to design molecules that will inhibit their formation. And we look at a wide range. We take inspiration from natural proteins that are in urine that do this. And we design small organic molecules that can operate in this function. The one that I'm showing you here right now, citrate, is the current therapy that's used. You can see that it's laden with carboxylic acid groups, and how this works is that this mimics oxalate. So on the upper right, you can see oxalate, and these groups come in and they bind to the calcium, and this is how they will target the surfaces of the crystals. So we target these in the drugs that we make, and the one that I want to talk about is one that's been quite effective. It's an analog of citrate called hydroxycitrate. A side-by-side -side comparison of these, they're almost identical with the exception of one alcohol group that's added. 
But as it turns out, that group makes all of the difference. So we've developed a team where I've been working with John Asplin, who's a nephrologist at Litholink Corporation that does your, um, urine analysis for us, Janine Bornpakis at the University of Pittsburgh that does computational studies, and our group experiments. What I'm showing on the left-hand side is just a bulk crystallization study where we compare these two molecules, and as we add more and more of these molecules, we see eventually you get about 60% inhibition in the growth of the crystals. But if you look at smaller concentrations of these, you see the blue symbols are hydroxycitrate. It's much more potent. In the electron micrograph, we actually see evidence that these will bind to the fastest growth direction. Right? So it's quite efficient. But a third aspect of this molecule that's quite unique is its mode of action. And how we figure this out is we do techniques using what's called atomic force microscopy. This is where you use a cantilever. It looks like a record needle. And you raster it over the surface of the crystal and in doing so, you can render three-dimensional images. And you do this over time, and you can start to extract movies that are shown here, where you can see these layers advancing across the surface over time. In a second, we're going to add hydroxycitrate. And what you're going to see is something that we had never seen before. These layers start to recede. In other words, the crystal is dissolving. Now, when you track the velocity at which these move across the surface, which I'm showing here as we progressively add more and more of the drug, what we see at the early stages, or the lower concentrations, is quite typical. You'll see it drop off, eventually going to zero, where you can completely suppress it. Where it goes negative, though, is quite unusual. And this is where we start to see this dissolution behavior. How is this working? Well, this is where we turn to computational work, working with Yanni's group at Pittsburgh, where he looks at how these molecules bind to different surfaces that are shown here. And we can compute this delta value. What this delta value is, is the net displacement of atoms in the surface of the crystal, because what happens is, as this molecule comes down to the interface, it pulls at the interface. It creates a strain, and the strain is what causes the dissolution. So a unique mode of action, but we were also very lucky in this sense, in, this, in the fact that this is an over-the-counter supplement. Hydroxycitrate is the active component of Garcinia cambogia, an extract from a fruit in Southeast Asia. It's used as a dietary supplement. You can go to the store and buy it, and we did. What you see here is actually a human trial study where seven people took this orally. We tested the urine after three days, and in fact, we see that it, it makes it to the target. What was even more surprising is that John Asplin did a study in his lab, not using simple solutions that we do, but looking in urine and doing bulk crystallization. And what he found is that the drug doesn't plateau at 60% inhibition. It plateaus at 96% inhibition. So there's a synergy that's taking place between this molecule and various proteins that are present in our native urine. And so for us, this has been very encouraging. It's, it's led us to continue with collaborations, for example, with David Goldfarb at NYU. We currently have clinical trials that are ongoing right now, as well as David Bashinsky, where we're doing animal models to test this with the hopes that this could supplant citrate as the next drug for kidney stones. And it's not only for calcium oxalate, we've seen it for another range of different types of stones where this can be effective, but we're branching beyond this to come up with a library of other molecules that can be infective inhibitors, but in some cases we actually find that these molecules can stunt nucleation, meaning they stop growth completely. This has allowed us to expand to other areas beyond stones. For example, in kidney disease shown here, in catheters, these crystals can simply plug these up. In the bottom, in a commercial standpoint, the oil and gas industry, as well as water purification and pipelines, you can get mineral scale that will block this. And so working on these, we found effective dissolvers, as well as inhibitors of these processes that have been very, very effective. Now, all of these examples are inorganic materials. It turns out you can use this also with organics. And a perfect example of this is in the area of malaria. Over the last eight years, I worked with Peter Vekolov in my department in collaboration with uh, David Sullivan at Johns Hopkins. Now, it goes without saying that malaria is a serious problem, not so much in the US, but in the equatorial regions of the world, where the deaths per year are quite staggering. Now, the question you might ask is, well, what does this have to do with crystallization? Well, once a parasite enters the body, it goes through several stages, one of which is this asexual stage where it will infiltrate red blood cells. It will then attack hemoglobin, our oxygen carrier. It catabolizes it and it releases heme. Ironically, heme is toxic to the parasite, and you might think by releasing this toxin that it will simply kill itself, but biology is smart, and they form innocuous crystals, as you can see in this electron micrograph of the digestive vacuole, so the toxin is nicely tucked away. 
For years, people have thought, well, how do anti-malarial drugs work? Do they work like I just showed you for kidney stones? Could they block growth? If they do, they slow it down, the toxin builds up, and then the toxin can kill the parasite. So when we started this, the slide I'm showing you now is really a combination of two to three years of work, because as it turns out, it's non-trivial to make these crystals. The environment where they form in the digestive vacuole of the parasite is complex. They have lipids as well as, uh, as well as an aqueous phase. But once we were able to figure this out, we were able to grow large crystals like you see here in the bottom left. And why that was influential was that we could then start doing in situ studies just like I had shown before using atomic force microscopy where we can see for the very first time how these crystals are growing at the interface right, through two-dimensional nucleation and spreading in these supersaturated growth solutions. So this created the platform for us to look at this, and we would then started to look at a wide range of anti-malarial drugs that you can see on the right. These are color-coded because if you start to now look at these velocity profiles from AFM studies that are shown here on the bottom left, you can see as you add more and more concentration of these different signature profiles, and what that translates to is that they have different modes of action. They bind to crystals differently, some more effective than others. And the one that we've been focusing more so on late is artemisinin, which is derived from a plant. And the National Academy of Engineering not too long ago put out uh, a report talking about the benefits of plants and how we can derive potential drugs from them. And artemisinin also gained a lot of notoriety in 2015 when a Chinese scientist, Tu Yuyu, won the Nobel Prize for this, the discovery of its isolation from this plant. Now, the mechanism of this had been fairly elusive. If you look at the life cycle of a parasite that's shown here on the left, so on the x-axis as it progresses in age, these shaded red regions are two regions where the drug can kill the parasite, an early stage and a later stage. In the early stage, what had been hypothesized is that artemisinin, in fact, is not stable. This endoperoxide bridge breaks and makes a radical, and it's been proposed that that radical does damage to the parasite. Now, at later stages, where the crystals start to form is where people have identified a different form of the drug that's shown on the bottom, where this, this radical can come and combine with heme to form this adduct. So we synthesized this adduct in our lab, and we tested it with two ways. On the left, at Johns Hopkins, they did parasite models, where we find at very low concentrations when we add this, we can completely kill the parasites. On the right, we tested this in AFM. The gray symbols you see are just artemisinin unchanged. Once we make the, act, the active form of this, we see right away that it starts to bind to the crystal surface and inhibit growth. Right, so we're starting to gain a better picture for how these drugs can work, not only in kidney stones, but in malaria, where we can develop molecular level pictures of this. And this is important for rational design, particularly in areas of malaria where parasites are developing resistance to drugs. And that's true for artemisinin as well. So this type of knowledge helps us to be able to predict new types of drugs for the future. In the remaining few minutes that I have, I want to shift to maybe a little bit more positive note. Up until now, we've been talking about trying to prevent crystals from growing, but I assure you in my group, we actually do like crystals. And so on the other side of the scale is the ability to control them. Crystals that are used in industry. We work with zeolites, which are nanoporous aluminosilicates. And these are used as catalysts to make not only gasoline, but value-added chemicals. The scheme that I show on the right are growth mechanisms that are known as non-classical. These are complex ones that differ from what I had just shown you previously, which was monomer by monomer. So the lower line were the biological materials. Above that, there's a wide range of different species by which crystals can grow. And one of the challenges with zeolites is that we simply don't know how they grow. It's very complex. And so, Another factor is, the, is that they grow at high temperatures, they require long times, it's hard for in situ studies, particularly AFM. And when I started at Houston, there was really no technique to do this. And so I worked with Asylum Research out of Santa Barbara over a period of four years with my student to develop the liquid cell that you see here that can go to high temperatures, that can essentially mimic realistic growth solutions of zeolites. What we were able then to do with that is to extract these movies that I had shown before where we can get unprecedented insight into how these crystals are growing at the near molecular level. On the left-hand side, for instance, growth by molecules. In the center, amorphous particles that come to the surface and rearrange into the crystal. And on the right-hand side, very small crystallites that come and have oriented attachment with the crystal interface. So a broad, diverse range of pathways by which these crystals can grow very complex systems. 
But the key is that once we're able to understand this, we can rationally design materials, and this has been a big aspect of our group, where we can control the final properties, size, shape, composition. All of these can have a huge impact on the way that these will perform in many of these industrial applications. And in fact, we've been very fortunate to work with a number of companies in this area, and this really ties in nicely with the theme of this meeting, research to commercialization. Because in many of the cases, both zeolites and metal oxides, we've developed catalysts that have already gone through pilot stages that are at the precipice of being commercialized. And in some cases, we have them at the early stages right now where we're starting to develop them towards that route. So it's been great being able to work at this boundary between applied and fundamental research, where on the fundamental side, we've been fortunate to be sponsored by a number of agencies like NSF, DOE, and the Welch Foundation here in the state of Texas, among others that we're very grateful for. The most important slide of all, though, are the people that actually did the work. And over the last 10 years at Houston, I've been very fortunate to work with a wide range of, of students and postdocs, as well as collaborators. This is a fairly recent picture of my group. Here I list uh, current students as well as former students that have contributed to this. And over the years, working with more than 40 collaborators that have really given us the ability to tackle these challenging problems and expand beyond techniques that in our group uh, we do, simply don't have the expertise to do. And so I'm very fortunate to have worked uh, with these people over the years to, to tackle these challenging problems in the area of crystal engineering. And so with that, I once again thank Tamist and I thank you for your attention and would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Anything out there? Okay. Uh, let me ask you one. Sure. Okay. Uh, I noticed you had a pipeline uh, application. Yeah. So talk a little bit about how we can use crystals to move solids better through pipelines like uh, hydrates, paraffins, asphaltines, things like that? Well, the, the, the one that you saw with the pipeline is actually a detrimental case where crystals can form. And so this is a case where you actually start to form a scale on, on the pipelines that will restrict the flow. So how do we keep that from happening? So inhibitors are one way, but the dissolvers that I showed, examples of a species where you could put this in a well or in a pipeline and be able to dissolve those minerals. Currently, right now, they have to completely shut down operation and, and bore these out. Uh, it's not only a time-consuming process, but it's an expensive process. So if we were to develop techniques where we could then ideally dissolve these, that would be best. Uh, the other approach would be in line with what we do with kidney stones. It's a more preventative approach, that if, you, if you're operating this, you can actually put these inhibitors in as you're operating to try and reduce the rate at which these will form in the pipelines. Yeah. So that's, that's a, a project we're working with Shell, for example, to, to try and implement these. Yeah, barium sulfide is particularly a problem. Yes. Yeah, barium, barium, barite, the one that we were working on, barium sulfate, is one of the most common. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.